see you. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We'd like to like to welcome you. I'm sorry, my voice is not as as not as strong as it more normally is, but I would like to welcome everybody to the December 3rd study session for the Mesa City Council. All of our council is present. The first item on our agenda for this meeting is to review the agenda for our meeting after this upstairs. And because this is the last uh, study session we'll have before the meeting on the 10th, we're also going to be reviewing both agendas for tonight's meeting and then a week from tonight. And then, uh, as you know, in, traditionally we have council meetings on the first and third Monday month of December, we'll have it on the first and second Monday, and, and uh, because of the holidays, not take off the last uh, two Mondays, right? Everybody clear on that? Yeah. So, Council, if you could please, first let's uh, focus on the agenda for tonight, December the 3rd. Any questions or concerns regarding that agenda? Currently, the only items off, well, there are, we have uh, three items off the consent agenda. <coughs> That's the photo safety enforcement program, um, the uh, acknowledging the, or enacting the, the election for the uh, quarter cent sales tax for dedicated to public safety, and a, a minor general plan amendment related to a zoning case. Uh, I think, Mr. Brady, we do have a, a, a staff presentation on the photo safety program. Is that yeah, correct? We have follow some follow up from some questions the council had. Okay, well, Council, before, before we get to that, is there any questions on any other item on the agenda before we get to that? Mayor. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to make a comment on 5C. Uh, this is creation of the irrigation water delivery districts. I know it's not a big deal to staff, but it is to the neighborhoods when we create these, when the neighborhoods go in and create this uh, irrigation districts, it allows them to maintain their irrigation districts and, and coordinate uh, repairs. So I appreciate staff working with everybody involved because these are a big deal and helps cut down costs and uh, helps owners become uh, more responsible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. <clears throat> Council, any other questions on agenda items before we uh, take on agenda item 8A? If not, uh, Mr. B, why don't, why don't we go ahead and, uh, Mr. Pombier, uh, we did, there were some questions raised, I think, in our study session last Thursday regarding this item, but uh, anxious to, to see your presentation on it. You got the comment over here? Sure. Mayor, I've got a quick presentation that we can run through to address some of those issues, and then obviously we'll be here for questions um, throughout. Uh, as we begin the presentation, uh, you can see that our, wait, go back one. Uh, we skipped to, I think you can use the arrows. Yeah, you're good. There we go. As you can see, we, we don't really call it a, a photo enforcement. We call it a photo safety program. And we, we focus on three things. We focus on education, engineering, and enforcement. All three of those things are very uh, paramount to how we run this program. And as you'll see later, uh, while some statistics are up and down, we have one overall statistic that we believe points directly to our um, three-pronged approach on how we do this. On the second page, of the presentation, it shows you the active locations which we discussed before, but I think the stat on here that is telling is the recidivism rate. 94% of, of the people who get these citations only get them once. As a 15-year criminal prosecutor, I'll, I'll tell you, if we could match that in any other aspect of criminal law, we'd be doing a heck of a job. That's a great number that shows you that this, this program, this enforcement aspect of the program has a lasting effect on the people who get those citations. As we move on to the third page, it, once again, this just shows you the location of the new sites, the one at Carriage Lane, the one in Southeast Mesa, and the one at Red Mountain High School. Those are our three newest sites, two traffic uh, red lights and one school zone. And as you can tell, I'm moving fast because I know time is of the essence. The next one shows uh, two, two things. One, it shows that there have been studies done. This has actually been on our website for quite a few years from the governor's office. Uh, that show there's a wide variety of support for these types of issues. As in most issues, the people you hear from the most are the people who are unhappy about it, but we have a wide variety of people who support these types of programs. And to go beyond the study, if you look at the number of complaints that we get and what ATS get, I, I believe it comes down to less than one half of one half of one percent or some number like that. Chris is much better with numbers than I am as he sits up and realizes that it just made something up. But that number of five complaints a year given the number of citations we do, is almost insignificant. 
And when you compare that to what ATS also gets, you can see that this is not something that we get far more complaints from officers who do stops than we do from these traffic cameras. And so it's important to understand the way we run that, this program is, is a way that we believe the, the residents of Mesa overall overwhelmingly support. Go on. Before you leave that slide, yes. John, <clears throat> Go back. Uh, I can tell you, I personally have received uh, some complaints over the last year, and I, I, so I, I, I'm a little skeptical to buy in totally to this, this statistic that says, and I, I'm not trying to be critical of the program, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I think we, uh, the, the, the statistic that's circled, 85% of residents are in favor of the cameras. What's the, can you, what's the source of that statistic? We, this, this has been on our website for quite a few years, and I think what Sergeant Londato would tell you is we got, a mo the vast majority of this information comes from the Governor's Office of? Highway Safety, yeah. Highway Safety. So that is our understanding. We've been trying to double check that source because it doesn't say so on our website. We've been trying to double check that source, but that's where everything else on that page come from, came from, and that's where we believe this came from. Okay, so this is a statistic from the governor's uh, From the surveys office. that were done in the past. Now, if you notice, I think the last survey is over five years old, okay. and, and a lot of things change over time, but these are the two most recent surveys we have of Mesa residents. Okay, understood. Thank you. As you go to the next site, and this is perhaps where the data begins to show um, a little bit more of the story, you see that we talk about the school zone data and how much speeds have dropped during the, when school's in session from 35 miles an hour is the speed limit to when school's out of session at 45 miles per hour a second. The other two charts on there will basically tell you that as speed reduces, your chances of surviving an ac accident greatly increase. And, and as we discussed before, part of our program has been education in those school zones to teach people if they slow down, we can better protect the lives of our students and our citizens in those areas. Go ahead. Next, in terms of program successes, On this slide, this is where we, we want to talk about the actual data. And, and I'm not huge on data, and there are people in this room that know it a lot better than I do. But if you look at the actual crash data that we sent out to you per intersection, and what our traffic engineers will quickly tell you behind us, and, and by the way, transportation has been a great partner in this. They do amazing work, and uh, they probably can explain this much better than I can. But we have some intersections since we put in, in cameras where traffic accidents have reduced. We have some where it stayed stable. And we've had some where they've actually gone up. So the data is all over the board. So why are we so um, forceful or supportive of this program? I think it's because when you take all three of our prongs, education, engineering, and enforcement, that we believe we get this answer right here that shows on this page. While accidents across the state went down by about 15%, in Mesa it was 35%. And we think it's because of all three of the things we do. Traffic engineering of our intersections, our enforcement, and our education. We think all three of those things lead to exactly what you're seeing here on this page, which is a reduction in actual traffic accidents. Now, obviously, I can't, go ahead, man. Well, the, the, uh, the box that circled was the, this 35% reduction. Uh, is that citywide, or is that, it seems like that, that's only at the intersections where we are doing photo enforcement? The, the top table refers to citywide, collisions citywide. Okay, now that I see city Mesa A and Mesa B. What, what's the difference? And they're similar. You know, numbers. and I, I had pulled that off of there. I do have a copy of it. I don't know off the top of my head what the, the data source B was, but in okay. regards to the point we're bringing out, it has to do with how we compare against regionally total collisions uh, citywide, not just in photo safety. Okay, so that's, that's an impressive statistic, and I thought you were overstating, because in the bottom it says active photo enforcement locations, 35%, but you're saying that's the number citywide, not just in the intersections where we have photo enforcement. So the, the bottom table <laughs> talks about um, in, uh, serious injury accidents. So two different topics. We're talking total collisions, mm -hmm. and the second one talks about the serious injury collisions which is, is much more demonstrative in our, in our data that we can show. Okay, so the, th the serious injuries have been reduced by 35.5% in the locations that we're using photo enforcement. Correct. And then citywide, there's been a reduction of 35.4% in motor vehicle accidents. Correct. Thank you, all right. Uh, yes. I have one question. If I'm analyzing the data correctly, I'm assuming there's only been 11 serious injury crashes from 2001 to 2005. 
and from 2007 to 2016, there was only 7.1, and that's where the 35.5% reduction is coming from. So there's not, if I'm understanding that correctly, there's not a significant amount of data. That's the uh, annual average. This, this would, should be per location, not total. I think what, there's an annual average of, right, of 11 right. per year, and now the aver annual average is seven per year. I got it. Okay, thank you. Okay. You're right. I was reading it Four. incorrectly. Yeah. Four. Yeah. Thank you. Good. This next slide uh, is something the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety um, did, and they showed the difference between when you have cameras that are activated and when you turn them off. <clears throat> So as much as it's hard to say what happens when you add a camera, what their study shows is when you take those cameras away, you see an increase in accidents. And once again, it's another prong to this that we believe helps show the, the, um, the value of our program. We spent a lot of time on Thursday talking about program reinvestments. I won't read through each one of these for you as, as everybody in this room can read, but the traffic department has done a great job through Ms. Ellis of asking us for certain things. As you can see where we spent the money in, in the past, we've put it so, towards some good programs. I highlighted for you last time Guerrero Elementary and how important it was that we had the money available to be able to give them what they thought would protect their students. We have many future opportunities lined out um, and we, can, we will continue to use uh, the fund, some of the funds that come from this program to reinvest uh, in our community and in the traffic engineering we believe helps make this program a success. Okay, I'm sorry, Don, I have a question on this as well, but go ahead, Chris. No. Well, first. go ahead. All right, I'll start. <laughs> um, my understanding, I know we haven't got to the slide yet that talks about what the, the amount of income that's produced by this, pro or the revenue, and I, right. I think it's roughly $2 million, but then about an annually about a million dollars in court fees are deducted from that. So the amount that, that from this program that goes to the general fund is roughly a million dollars. That's that correct, But Your slides will tell us that later. So if you look at the, 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 what we've spent the money on, or well, what we've spent, uh, the, the money we've spent on, on traffic safety in, in the first set of bullet points, you know, that's maybe a couple hundred, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars, which right. is obviously less than a million dollars per year that is coming to the city general fund. So the argument could be made that, that uh, this is, it's nice to label it a, a traffic safety program, but it's actually a revenue producing program. It produces more revenue than, than we use for, for traffic safety. Now, I don't believe that's true. I believe that if we were to actually. Yeah, I mean, we're not counting for all signalized intersections that we include every year. Yeah. We, th we think about the pedestrian. What do you want to call them, RJ? Pedestrian hybrid beacons. Pedestrian hybrid beacons. Pedestrian, pedestrian, yes. It's a lot easier to say the name brand. Yes. But pedestrian hybrid beacons, and we've had discussions about putting those in around the city. Those are about, what, 200, RJ, 250, 300,000? We had it, we, remember in our bond package for the canals, we actually um, reduced some of the scope of that project, which included pedestrian crossing. So. Right there, I think between RJ and uh, the two of us, we could probably come up with a half million dollars, a three quarter million dollars in about five minutes. Right, uh, so I, I think this slide that are pending, I, it, that are it pending. understates Absolutely. the investment that the city's yeah. making in traffic safety and pedestrian safety. So one of, and, 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 but it also plays to the critics of this program where they say, well, this is more about revenue generation than it is about traffic safety. And uh, that's, I think that's a fair uh, criticism to make, you know, based on some of the information that we're providing. I, what would what would happen if we were as a council to say to staff we want to see how the the revenues from this program are spent uh, and so we'd like to have a separate budget item that that tracks the revenues from this program and compare that to what we're spending on traffic and pedestrian safety programs what I believe is that the revenue coming from this is going to be less than Right. Uh, the revenue, or the, what we're spending on traffic safety. If it's not, then I think our our, our priorities are out of whack, and we right. and we need to make some adjustments. But I don't believe that's the case. Right, and Mayor, I would suggest okay. even we would take that to the point where we could say, whatever the, the estimate, the number is, we could bring those list of projects to the council because every year, I think almost every district has a need for some kind of traffic safety uh, infrastructure or driver feedback signs, uh, pedestrian crossing signs, new signals, 
you know, as long as they meet the criteria that we have in traffic engineering, and there are many out there, I think we'd bring those to council to be very transparent about the dollars that are being collected here and the specific list of projects um, that we would be budgeting that would be funded from those funds. We could do that. Okay. So if, and I haven't, I haven't run this by my fellow council members, but if there were an appetite to, to do that, to ask staff to, to track the revenues and, and apply them to uh, pedestrian and traffic safety uh, projects in the city, because I think we all acknowledge that Mesa is a relatively safe city and we've seen we, we're, we're trending in a good direction, but still, I mean, there are horrible traffic accidents on a regular basis in our community that are injuring and killing people, and, and I, I think it's a, a, a justifiable cause for us to take on, saying we, we need, we're going to apply these revenues to try to impact that problem in our community. Uh, and so we need to sell this, and if people need to understand that that's where the money's going. It's, this is not a, a milking <laughs> operation uh, for us to, to, to get money out of the, the people that use our streets. Anyway, that's, that's my two cents at this point. Thank if, if there's no one else. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Yes, Chris. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Freeman. Okay, you got me going here a little bit and thinking. Um, I don't consider it a milking program because if a person violates a traffic law, they're issued a citation. And that citation is now not done by a officer on the street that witnessed it, but, but, but by an automated program. So there's a violation that occurs. We're just now through the process of uh, the traffic violation, we collect a fine, and that fine is then going to pay for our safety program. And that's what I'm engaged in, is if, if we can develop safety programs for the good of the community, um, and I talked about um, perhaps lecture and uh, partnership with Mesa Public Schools reaching into the high schools, because I feel that's important. But to, to teach teenagers as well as older people, um, I did my own personal survey. I sent it out uh, just a random email to Blind Carbon Copy, uh, 10 people in my district. And it was about 50-50. So I, I think um, I'm, I'm still 50-50. So I'm waiting for you know more information here as we go move forward. Mayor, Council Member Freeman. Uh, the ATS, the, the company that we work with, has already helped us produce, I believe, five or six PSAs. They'd be more than willing to work with us towards getting something that we could get into the schools for some of our younger drivers so that we're, hit, we're getting to them very early about the importance of their speed and, and what can happen if you don't watch that. They've been a great partner in this, and, and I have no doubt that they'll help us make those so that we can air them with the Mesa Public Schools and on Channel 11. Yes, Mr. Luna. Uh, so, John, I appreciate all what you've been doing. I've you know, certainly seeing what the difference it's made at Red Mountain High School. As I said, you know, I worked in the Mesa Public Schools for many years. And being around the high school students that are just learning how to drive and having these, uh, uh, these traffic signals to mitigate, mitigate some of the potential uh, accidents that could occur, it has been dramatically, has dramatically changed how kids are driving. And so I can see it, I see the potential it has. Certainly saw what happened at Guerrero Elementary School, uh, having the, the traffic mitigation signals there to deter potential drivers hitting pedestrians, and especially the crosswalk personnel. I think uh, what you're doing there is, is important, and I'd like to see more of that. So uh, I'm going to be supporting this as it moves forward. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. You know, I, I've never been a real uh, big fan of photo radar, but the simple fact is if you obey the speed laws and you obey the, the traffic laws, there wouldn't be a need for photo radars. Um, it's not like we can pay an officer, you know, to sit out at an intersection for uh, 24 hours a day um, where we can for a, a fraction of that cost, we can put a camera out to ensure that people are obeying those laws versus having a motor officer or a patrol officer sitting out there 24-7. Um, back to the mayor's point, I think, I think it's a really great idea to um, split out uh, outside of the budget what would normally be budgeted for our traffic um, signals and so forth. Um, you know, so when you look at future opportunities, things that aren't um, within the budget um, that may come up throughout the year. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Guadalupe, the Highland Junior High um, issue that came up earlier this year. Um, you know, if we had dollars that were, that were sitting in an account where we could 
ordered the traffic signals or the hawk systems or whatever it was that could be utilized in those situations, you know, I think the mayor's actually on to something in, in that situation. So look outside of what's already being budgeted, um, what can we do on top of that uh, for the safety of our communities? And Mayor and Council, uh, and RJ, correct me if I'm wrong. So today, if you didn't have this fund and we didn't have these dollars to pay, fund these other traffic signal infrastructure. The request comes to RJ for uh, a pedestrian crossing or another traffic signal. Those dollars come out of his streets fund. So what that means is it's not competing necessarily in the general fund, it's competing against pavement. It, it, it's, they're in the same pot, right? So it's either you buy a traffic signal or fix you, you fix a pothole. So that's kind of where I guess the choices are today. Mm -hmm. Um, and so obviously using this source of funding, as you're suggesting, we would set aside specifically and, um, and it would just be, you know, things related, whether it's education or actual um, photo safety um, or not photo safety, um, driver feedback signs or crossing signs, we could do that. And I think that's one of the one of the issues that are not an issue, but the hardest part to explain sometimes to citizens is like, you know, how come you can't just go out and put a signal or a street light or or what have you um, out on a roadway? And it's you know you you have a limited pot of money that you have seven of us that are fighting over, um, and it's not that easy just to to have somebody. You know, all of a sudden say, you know what? Yeah, I'll give you my two hundred thousand dollars because I'd rather you have the Hawk system than than my citizens in my district. So, you know, it, you have to explain that sometimes to the citizens to, that they understand that there is this limited pot of money and you're either having the potholes fixed, the, the lane widened out, or you're having a turn signal put in. So which one is, is the, the more important? And I think if you were able to split them off and then you'd have that, those funds available. I was thinking we move on. Um, the next part we were requested to show the citation process. This kind of looks like a Venn diagram, probably not the easiest to read on your screen. I won't try to read all of them, but it walks through what happens when a citizen gets one of these tickets and what the court process is, if they need to be served, what happens then, and all the way up to the end, and what can happen in court if they go to court, if they go to school, or, or how they take care of it. Where we think the process becomes even more important is as you turn the page and you look at our activity, this is the, the chart we were talking about, the number of times the cameras flash versus the number of citations we issue. First, ATS reviews to see if they see anything, and if they see something that's questionable, they kick it out. Then they send it to the Mesa Police Department, and we have a, a member of the Mesa Police Department review these citations, and they kick some out. So we end up with, I wanna say, about 60, 65% of the actual flashes end up in citation. So the first step of the process before the individual ever gets the citation, it goes through two sets of review. And that gives us a firm confidence that we're dealing with citations that would stand up in, within traffic court. Um, and you can see those numbers are nowhere near uh, high. I mean, I think 50, as low as 50% and as high as 65%. The next one that we go to is the expense and revenue report. Uh, as the mayor has already alluded, uh, after the, all that, the, the direct expenses and the uh, revenue that is already obligated uh, to the courts through restricted fund revenue, we have about a million dollars left. One of the things I, I, we leave out of this presentation is there is one additional arm to our enforcement that I, I don't think should get lost here. Traffic enforcement is also done every day by the men and women that work for the Mesa Police Department. Um, that number, as this council well knows, easily dwarfs that $1 million also, just in what we spend in our police department. So our, part of our traffic enforcement is also funded by the general fund, which, is, which comes over um, f from some of this money. So we feel very strongly that those two things together on the enforcement end, what our men and women uh, the officers do and what these cameras do, gives our citizens the best level of protection. Uh, one question was uh, about the, the volume that we use on this. We have, we will have after this is all said and done, 20 intersections out of about, I think RJ told me over 400. 466. Correct? 466, so less than 5% of our intersections actually have these cameras. This is not something we're, we're out to get you. This is a, purely an education mode that we want people to slow down in certain areas, be it our school zones or our high volume traffic signals. The last slide I have for you before I get to questions is, as part of this uh, extension of this contract, we will be, renewal of this contract, we will be, uh, have available to the newer technology that ATS has. And you can see the difference in those photos. Uh, we hope that that leads us when we have flashes to make sure we are even more certain of the individuals that we actually send the citations to. 
That's the value of better cameras is, is more confidence in how we do it as it goes through both levels of those review. Our last slide is for questions. I tried to fly through that as quickly as I possibly could. Uh, sit back and take any questions this council has. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I had two questions. The first has been uh, addressed, and, and that's that I'd like to get a, a better accountability for what the income or the revenues from the program are compared to the, how that money is being spent for pedestrian and traffic uh, safety programs. The second and it is related to school zones. Uh, I know, that I, I, I think there's less pushback on the red light cameras because I think most people acknowledge uh, how terribly uh, dangerous it is for folks to run red lights. Uh, and then the, the speed cameras though that we have in front of the various school locations, I think people also understand the importance of uh, enforcing uh, traffic laws in, in and around school zones during school. But some of the pushback that I hear on this program is, hey, I, you know, it, not during school hours, I, the, 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 it turns from a safety device into a, a speed trap. Um, so my question would be, what if we uh, regulated the hours of operation for those, for those speed cameras and, and had them only in effect during school hours when it, the, we can justify the, the, you know, the tie that to student safety versus just a an opportunity for us to take your picture if you're speeding. Uh, Mayor, Council, I think the first response I would have to that is what we're trying to teach people in general in our community is when you're in a school zone, you need to slow down, period. Secondly, Mayor, it is very difficult for us to set any of those hours. There are after school functions. Many of our elementary, many of our schools that have these, um, have fields that are used by teams on weekends, odd hours, things like that. Plus people take their kids to these playgrounds to play during hours. What we're, the message we're trying to send is whether it's 35 or 45, we think exceeding the speed limit at those times in these areas is never okay. And so we are very firm and we want to educate that you slow down when you're in a, in a, speed, in a school zone. And as much as I understand what you're saying, they become, to a, in effect, a mid-block speed camera on the off hours, we don't truly know when those off hours are going to be. And we do not have the capability to adjust those on a daily basis, depending on which school has what activity going, depending on which, which little league team is using a field on which day. So the message we're trying to say, say is in these specified areas, the community as a whole wants you to slow down because we think that's, that's the better message than trying to time it. But John, we could, council could, if that's their direction, we could just establish, just like you drive through a school zone today and you see the lights flashing for a specific period of time, and I understand the point is our after school programs and we're concerned about that. And actually the history we have is that's when the most, the legacy of what happened here was the, the tragedy that actually happened after school. But if that's what council wants to do in the school zones, obviously we could, it would just have to be a generic, you know, it applies to elementary schools or middle schools, right? And just set at those hours and that's it. But I think the vulnerability is the, as John's saying, there's other times that there may be activities, but if we're only going to set it, if we're always just going to set it for school times and a specific time, we could do that. We can't adjust it every day, but we could set it for school day. Just like you have flashing yellows when you go through a school zone, you know that it's there from whatever, eight or seven to four, whatever it is, yeah. <clears throat> I think it would bolster our credibility with the community if we did that, frankly, and, and take away the suspicion that this is an excuse uh, to generate revenue. Uh, I, I live across the street from an ele elementary school, and I know how dangerous, and I mean, any, I think everybody in that environment during school, coming during school hours is, is, would be very supportive of any type of traffic enforcement that we could have. If we could afford to have a, a motor officer there every day, I think everybody would, would love that. But, but I think the attitude is different during non-school hours. And sure, there are, there are always activities uh, at night and on weekends related to school, but, but you don't have that, that intense environment where you've got sidewalks full of young children and, and you know, a heightened uh, potential for a disaster. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, a far less compelling uh, scenario for justifying photo enforcement than during school hours. Mr. Luna. Um, having worked in schools for 40 years, uh, you're still going to have the same kids. Um, 
if you do it from, let's say, from 7.30 to 4 o'clock, there are so many extracurricular activities that these kids are involved in. Um, there's still going to be the same drivers. So I wouldn't change what we have in place. I would just leave it the way it is. That would be my concern because we, we don't want anybody to die. <clears throat> I respect that. Um, like I say, I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, as I look at the phone, the, I, I, I don't believe the statistic that 85% of our community embraces this program. I, I think it's maybe something a lot do, but I, I think there's, there's some skepticism. And I, I would like to respond to the skeptics, and I think this would be a, one way to do that. So if, if I'm in the minority on this, I will, that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll vote to, to, to support the program regardless, but I was curious to kind of take the council's temperature on this, the school zone issue and see what you thought. Yes, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Thompson. I beat you. Oh, go ahead. How are the intersections chosen uh, by traffic volume or motor vehicle accidents, or how do we, again, choose intersections uh, that we have currently today? Quite frankly, it's usually there's some sort of catalyst, much like the one, the most recent one would be at uh, Guadalupe and Carriage Lane. This actually came from the community. We were receiving calls complaining about people running the lights westbound uh, at that location. And, and so we went out there and studied it. And in fact, we were seeing people run lights. Um, we did speed studies. Speed is, is probably the primary uh, factor that's the deciding point, but all of it's looked at. What type of collisions, the speeds that are going through there, what violations are observed, uh, and then it's either, you know, unfortunately it's usually a terrible accident or something from the community. But the original intersections back how long ago? 13 <laughs> years ago? Something like that? Yeah, where that was chosen it, by traffic chosen by both no well, it was accidents and PD and in traffic got together and and, and put those yeah, together. Yeah, if you remember our our um, you know like they we had our 10 deadliest intersections, right. you know that have since been re-engineered like Dobson and Southern, you know, the cameras came down from there and haven't gone up because engineering's taking care of it. And I can tell you that the school zones were based on speed. The speed that the individual drivers were going through those areas required us to put something in there that got them to slow down. I have a follow-up question. You know, I, because of my prior employment, uh, life safety is very important to me. And I've weighed this very seriously because I've, I've seen what these accidents have done in intersections. So I've also weighed the public's input on you know, people I've contacted, and I, and I understand that... Uh, their concern, but then I go back to the fact that they uh, created a violation, a traffic violation, again, that wasn't caught by a human being, but it was caught by a, a, an automated system. And, and of course, we have to uh, pay a service for that uh, because we're not going to go out and monitor and pay for this system. And the other thing that I weigh in is the revenue stream that we've collected and how that's uh, paid for and the, and the traffic violations through the court system and then the reallocation of those funds uh, through uh, safety and education, which is important to me. Um, the other part uh, Mr. Brady talked about and RJ about if we didn't have this funding stream, then we would have to fund this out of the budget of, out of certain line items. And so I, I guess I don't want us to be caught into a, a trap where financially we have to rely on these funds to create these safety programs, yet the same fact uh, they are beneficial to some extent, even though you got caught. I'm sorry, pay your fine. And there's a 55 to 60 percent, I think you said, recovery on a trap uh, photo, uh, according to your notes. So 55 to 60 percent are actually of captures versus actual citations issued. Yes. Yeah. So those are the people that actually receive the Tickets. the fine and actually right. pay citations, it at the end of yes. the day. Um, I'll just be flat out. I'm going to support the program. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, and I, I agree with Councilmember Luna. Um, you know, I, if we were going to have red light cameras or if we're going to have safety, uh, photo safety cameras anywhere, to me, they would be at schools. Um, you know, I would love to have one in, uh, sitting in front of Highland Junior High. I mean, the people fly down Guadalupe in front of that junior high 
even though the flashing, you know, 35 mile per hour signs are out, people are routinely doing 50. Uh, when I used to go and drop my kids off there many years ago, um, I would sit at the cross at the you know when the when the safety officer would come out with the, or the crosswalk crossing guard would come out with their sign, and even with the with the person standing in the middle of the roadway with a sign, people are still running through through the intersection or through that crosswalk with children and and, and so for me, I mean, I would if I'm going to support these, I would support having them at schools, and so I wouldn't change anything about the the time frames on schools because I think it creates confusion overall for the driver, so. Okay, well, yeah, I, I thought I'd throw it out there. I, my preference would be to tie the, fo this, this, the school zones to school activity, to uh, uh, coming to and from school, so, uh, so they don't just become generic photo enforcement zones after that. But, uh, but I'll, I'll support the program, and if I'm in the minority on that idea, I, I can live with that. Uh, other now, again, we're just reviewing the agenda for upstairs. So, so, but Mayor, what I hear direction from Council is yeah. um, maybe during this upcoming uh, budget discussion, one of the t discussions we'll have, if well, I'm making an assumption here, if the work <laughs> were to be approved upstairs, then one of the items we'd bring to the Council is a discussion about and a list of these of the kinds of projects I've heard today and other suggestions related to traffic safety, pedestrian safety around the city, and we would. Um, provide a list of those projects, discuss those with council, make sure they may meet your expectations, and then we could just monitor um, the revenue over the years and allow us to yeah. fund those. I think I, that's what I heard from council. So. I've seen heads nodding, so okay. yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh yes, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Which department today currently sees the excess revenue generated by the program? Does it does that excess immediately go over transportation, or does that stay in PD? No. And does PD, like how does that, yeah, does that so money there, flow? No department, the departments like to think they have revenues. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> I make that clear to them every year. Um, they may collect fees and permit fees, but they all go back to the better good, the greater good of the city as a general. Um, RJ, because the city back in 1986 approved a sales tax for um, street specifically. So there is a street sales tax fund um, that specifically we track and those dollars then are used for maintenance and um, operations of the traffic department including paving, paving and other items such as the uh, many of the items we're talking about here. So the, the revenues are received from citations whether they're photo radar or otherwise um, those are collected and then they go into the general fund overall budget as part of just the revenues that come into the city. But I th what we're proposing here is to be more specific, I think, is to create a specific separated um, identity of the revenues coming from this program, and then specifically through the council process, identify projects um, equal to that amount <clears throat> that we could um, help address uh, traffic safety throughout the city. Okay, so that I understand. So then next year, our budget would contain a specific uh, line item or a fund of the excess revenue generated from this program. And then I'm assuming today that goes into the general fund, so that money would be extracted from the general fund into right. this so it own would be fund. Fewer dollars. Yeah, it would be net of what we're already funding. I, yes, that's correct. Okay. And the second question I had was, I, I, John, I know you and I had spoke earlier about the uh, speed on green as far as the camera goes. Can you clarify, uh, the red light cameras, will they be issuing speeding citations as well or only if the individual runs a red light? That's an improvement to the program, right? It's two separate things. So it's triggered if they run the red light at any speed and it's triggered if they, they're speeding. And that's a new thing. That's well, it was not. A, it was a new thing, probably three or four years ago. Speed on green was something that was new. That all of the companies that handled this type of program had added on because what they saw was people gunning it to get through the intersections. So it used to just be strict red light cameras. Three or four years ago, they added on this ability for speed on green, and now they run it pretty much on all the cameras that they have. But are we enforcing so, speed on green? What? Speed on green is only in the school district, or the no. If you run, a, if you go through an intersection, oh, in and over addition the, to, okay. in addition, so if you, it's a red light or and or speed on green. So as it sits today, the red light cameras 
are actually dual function without the individual running a red light if they are speeding today those cameras will issue citations for speeding because i've never seen that i've never seen speed that. on green yeah, there is speed on green on yes. these things it, it, the reason it came to be is what we talked about the what we saw was a lot of people gunning it to get through the intersection and so that's when it generally picks it up so generally you're going to see a citation for both because <clears throat> Unfortunately, they don't generally make it, but there is a speed on green aspect to this. Hmm. Okay. But that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. So, well, uh, this will be on the agenda upstairs, and uh, obviously we've had a lot of discussion now, and we'll see how much we want to do upstairs. Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda, uh, RJ, thanks for sticking <laughs> around. <laughs> is uh, to hear a presentation, discuss, and provide direction on staff recommendations for regulating oh. shared active transportation vehicles. Mayor, and after we do this, we're gonna go back and do the 10th agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. The 10th agenda item is the, the- The one that we are- The one for December 10th. December oh, yes, 10th. you're right, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry, thank you, Chris. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, I'm sorry, I skipped over that. So let's, we can do this, but we, we need to go back and probably review the it. December 10th. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, good evening again. Uh, I am RJ Zeter with the Transportation Department. Uh, to my right is uh, El Zubi. Uh, he is uh, one of our supervising engineers who oversees our bike and ped uh, program. Eric Darian to my left, uh, Deputy Director for Traffic Engineering, and uh, Andrew Calhoun, uh, Management Assistant. We've all been involved on in this conversation. Sh shared active transportation vehicle. It's kind of a mouthful. I'll try to go quickly. I know you've got a lot to, to discuss. Um, we actually copied this from our, our neighbor to the west, Tempe. Uh, you might you also hear this referred to as dockless, whether it's bikes or scooters or e-bikes. Um, you'll also hear it referred to as micro-mobility devices. This is one of the catchphrases that you'll see out there uh, right now. Um, but essentially, it's anything that is uh, a shared uh, vehicle that is used within uh, the public um, right-of-way uh, that doesn't require docking, as you might be uh, uh, knowledgeable about with the grid system, you know, that initially came in with bikes, that's a docked system uh, where folks actually have to park and lock the bikes at specific location. Uh, the rentals can uh, vary minutes to hours. Uh, as an example right now from the research we've done, uh, the scooters that you're seeing out there uh, are in the dollar, uh, a dollar to rent and then about 15 cents a mile, uh, you know, on, on top of the initial dollar uh, fee. And people can do that Oh, sorry, 15 cents a minute, uh, forgive me. Uh, and people can use their cell phone, you know, their smartphone uh, with an app uh, to, you know, release the vehicle and, and then lock it uh, when they're done. Uh, currently, uh, uh, there are two companies primarily that have uh, motorized scooters uh, in Mesa, that's Bird and uh, Lime. Um, you may also see every now and then a red scooter that's operated by a Razor a company. Uh, to our knowledge, they haven't, quote, staged any, ve any vehicles in Mesa, meaning placing them, but we do see some bleed over from time to time, primarily from Tempe. Um, you know, the OFO bikes came in, and almost as quickly as they came in, they went back out, uh, although you'll still see a smattering of them uh, that have lingered uh, about uh, being used uh, in Mesa, but they're not being rented. Uh, why involve the city? Um, the, the issue from a traffic engineering, uh, from a transportation standpoint, primarily revolves around right-of-way management uh, and uh, ensuring that operators are properly staging their vehicles if allowed, uh, dealing with complaints as well as rebalancing them, meaning day-to-day -day that, you know, where the scooters start from may not be where they end up and that there's a process that, you know, the, the, the shared active uh, vehicle uh, is uh, put in the place that it belongs, as well as data collection so that we as a city have the ability to see where uh, and how uh, the vehicles are being used. Issues that we're currently facing, as I touched on, uh, and you can see this when you're driving around, um, we have met, and there's representatives from both Bird and Lime here in the audience. Um, one of the benefits to the scooters we're seeing right now, as opposed to the bikes, is that the uh, scooter companies have to physically touch their inventory, really every day. The, the bikes, they did not, you know, so if a bike 
was parked someplace where it was not supposed to be parked, um, we were relying on the company, but sometimes complaints come in and that could take more time. Whereas with the scooters, because they have to be charged, are physically pulled off of the right of way, charged off site, and then brought back uh, the next day. Uh, but we do have concerns or issues at times uh, with blocking handicap ramps for sidewalks, just blocking sidewalks in general, uh, and not allowing for a, a clear path uh, for folks with a disability. Bus stops uh, can be an issue, as well as blocking entrances uh, into businesses. Uh, also, we do hear from folks that bikes and or scooters have been left uh, on private property, and the owners you know, may, may have concerns about that. Uh, operator responsiveness, uh, again, at least with the scooter companies that are, are in Mesa now, that's been better uh, than it was with at least one of the bike providers. Uh, at times, the, um, with one of the bike providers I won't name, um, I actually sent an email to their general customer service, as anybody would, uh, and 10 days later, I got a, a customer satisfaction survey, um, but never got a response to the original concern uh, that uh, I lodged. Uh, but we're doing better right now with, with Lime um, Bird. Um, these bikes or scooters can be vandalized, and we, we've seen that. Uh, I think Al at one point had to go over a fence to get one back off you know, uh, someone's property. You may have read a story about a, a, a charger, uh, apparently pulled a scooter out of a, a pool and decided it'd be a great idea to charge it in her apartment. Uh, didn't work so, out so well for the scooter or the apartment, I'm told, um, but that's an isolated incident. Uh, and then there's concerns <coughs> that get raised just about aesthetics within the right of way. Uh, safety concerns, speed uh, is, is a concern of ours. Excuse All, me, RJ. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a question. Mr. Hey, not that related, but yeah. the scooter that exploded in the apartment, are you indicating that that scooter actually came out of a pool before they charged it. That's the reason why it exploded, not just because it randomly exploded. According to the Arizona Republic, that is okay. what happened. I just wanted to make <laughs> that. Thank you. Uh, uh, sp speed concerns. The roadway system was not designed for the shared active vehicles, specifically the scooters. Um, obviously, they're out there, they're popular, they're being used, um, but the roadway system was not designed with, with that motorized device uh, in mind. Uh, these scooters can be speed limited. Uh, we know that one of the, the vendors, perhaps both that are operating right now, limit the top speed to 15 miles an hour. Um, but with an inex inexperienced user uh, at 15 miles an hour, uh, that still can create safety issues. Uh, 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 one of the vendors actually has a program for offering helmets through its app. Sorry. Mr. Freeman. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Mr. Luna. So, RJ, so you're riding one of these scooters, you fall and you break your arm. Mm -hmm. uh, Who's liable? Is it the scooter company or is it the individual? Or if, what if it's a kid? Uh, one of the things we're seeking is direction uh, from mayor and council as to how to move forward. Uh, one approach is to create a licensing structure around the companies that are operating uh, scooters or e-bikes or whatever the next technology may bring. And there would be an indemnification and insurance provision uh, within the, the license uh, that would require those providers to hold the city harmless. Uh, so. Um, I don't want to get into there's user acceptance agreements, and I don't know how those affect minors that may be riding scooters that shouldn't be riding scooters. Um, but at a city level, uh, if council directs us to, you know, uh, create a licensing structure, uh, we would look for insurance and indemnification from the companies. Sure. Maybe RJ, uh, you might not be the one to answer it. Maybe the uh, uh, vendors would, but inexperienced users really bother me because uh, I see young people out there. You know, I know they're 12, 13 years old using these, and then they're riding on sidewalks, they're in the uh, road right of ways, and they really shouldn't be riding these things, but yet we're allowing them. So I'm, I'm wondering what our liability is as a city. You know, recently I just saw three people on one, and uh, an adult with two children, and I thought, well, that's really not built for that structurally. But I think there's a lot of unknowns there. In my mind, as you go through the presentation, I, I probably have another couple of questions, but uh, that's where I'm at. On, on that point, we are working with Mr. Smith and his staff. So if council does direct us uh, to move towards some sort of regulation, that is something we want to try to address. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask, Jim. Is, is there a way, because I know we just had an issue not too long ago where somebody hit a guide wire on a, on a, a pole that was not ours, um, and the city was just as liable. And so is there a way to indemnify the city um, if it happens on city property, if it happens within the city right away? 
Can we be indemnified? Yeah. Mayor and Council, uh, Councilmember Thompson. Yeah, we'll, we'll include a broad indemnity, duty to defend and hold harmless in the city and also insurance. Um, and so, you know, that's still to be negotiated. And so that's going to be an important part of this, whether or not they're willing to, to provide that. But that would be a key, obviously. Thank you. Proceed. Sure. Um, again, helmets specifically. Uh, one of the providers does have a, an option through their app uh, that I found last week, you know, that you can get a helmet. Um, you have to pay a shipping fee, um, but realistically, there's no way to, I think, enforce that. I think that that is an issue. I've not yet seen a person wearing a helmet uh, on a scooter. I'm not saying they're not wearing them. I'm only stating my own observations. So that is, you know, and, and we have heard from some folks who have stated that their children, for example, have been injured, you know, on the scooters. A question on that. Do we require... I'm assuming we require helmets on bikes. Is there an ordinance that exists today for just a regular bike? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Whitaker, there is no requirement that helmets be worn. For motorcycles, for bicycles, and the, the, I'm not an expert at, at state statute, but I don't believe that at the state level there's any requirement that helmets are required on motorized vehicles. I, I was trying to remember that. Is there a, a mandate for helmets for, uh, for motorcyclists that are of a certain age, minors? Okay. I, believe, I, believe, I know on recreational vehicles, any anyone under um, 18 has to wear a uh, helmet. I believe that's correct. Uh, Andrew did find some was looking yeah. at statutes today, and I believe that's correct. Yeah. But for adults, there's there's no requirement that helmets be worn. Are we talking about requiring uh, helmets then for these? Uh, we would seek direction from from council. We have not gotten that far. Again, I think enforcement of that though is is challenging. Okay. Uh, approach regulation versus non-regulation, some of the things I've touched on, right-of-way management, requiring operators to respond, restage, rebalance, as well as aesthetics. Um, you know, more free market approach is to allow, um, you know, the vendors are, or the operators uh, to work uh, without regulation. Um, the con to that, of course, is that there's less control of what's happening within our right-of-way. Approach by other cities quickly. Phoenix uh, adopted a, an ordinance uh, last summer. Uh, it only adoc uh, addressed bikes at this point. <clears throat> that's what the, was all, you know, the big issue was, you know, the bike companies being in town. Uh, so they have not yet addressed scooters or, or other technology. Uh, they have a requirement that's called lock two, uh, meaning that the bike itself, bikes in this case, would have to have a device that would allow the bike to be physically locked to something. Um, we have concerns about that as a staff because if the bike is locked to something we don't want it locked to, uh, it actually may be more challenging to deal with that since we wouldn't immediately have the ability to um, remove or impound a, uh, a bike uh, violating one of our regulations. Uh, Tempe is moving through their process and anticipate that they will in fact implement a right-of-way license for shared active transportation vehicles in February of 2019. Scottsdale took a slightly different approach. They did not create a licensing process, but they created a bunch of stipulations by city code about where you can park things and fines for the vehicles being in uh, inappropriate places. Um, but to my knowledge, they are not pursuing licensing at this point. So the staff recommendation, uh, again, we're seeking council direction on this, that should we create a, a license, should we create terms and conditions that go with that license, as well as we would need to make modifications to the city code. Uh, we actually found inadvertently that there's some pretty old language in the city code um, requiring bicycle licensing. Um, it has a three digit ordinance number and I think that means it was adopted in 1940 uh, or something uh, back then. So there, there's some cleanup work that we would need to do. Uh, there's, some, there's some language in there that actually some of our citizens uh, based on their own research have pointed out to us um, that we would likely need to uh, clean up. Um, quickly, uh, talk about staging, education, uh, about proper parking. You know, that's a big issue. You may be aware if you follow this at all that ASU uh, and uh, University of Arizona have both banned scooters uh, from the, their campuses. Working with at least one of the vendors, we'd want to talk to, to the others as well. Um, they're, 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 the, the technology itself can be used to help limit no ride areas potentially. Again, I've talked about speed being capped as well as no parking areas being at the end of the ride. Um, we would look, if we're directed to, to require that the vehicles be restaged every 24 hours, uh, including removing all of the vehicles from residential streets and private property. Uh, if we're so directed to work on a license, we would propose no staging 
of these vehicles within residential uh, on residential streets. Um, there's also impoundment penalties we could talk about that if the company failed to respond that city staff would be able to go out and impound the vehicle along with the fee and then the statistics that we talked about. Uh, this is just a concept uh, of a fee RJ, structure. I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mr. Thompson. RJ, uh, the, the, the piece that I would struggle with, honestly, is, is the staging in, um, or I guess I wouldn't really struggle with it, but it's a staging within neighborhoods mm -hmm. because that was the whole premise of bringing the Lime bikes and some of the other bikes uh, into Mesa was to be that last piece from the bus stop to um, to the residents and then from the residents back to the bus stop the following morning or afternoon, what have you, to get on the bus to, to go to work. So it was, it was part of that transportation model that was sold to council as why um, Lime and some of these others were great ideas to bring to the city. And now we're saying, well, we don't really want them in neighborhoods. Uh, we don't want to stage them in neighborhoods. So that, it, that really kind of defeats the whole purpose of having the Lime bikes out anyway if, if somebody's going to have to walk from their house to the bus stop to, to get a bike. So uh, I, Perhaps I should be more specific, Councilmember Thompson. Uh, the thought we had, and certainly we're looking for council direction, is that we would prohibit it actually on a residential street, meaning the local street. It, there may be a possibility for collectors and certainly arterial streets abutting um, residential neighborhoods. What we were trying to avoid is staging in front of someone's house um, because we, we have already gotten some complaints about that. So, RJ, when you use the word staging, mm -hmm. is that different than an individual just dropping it off in front of their house? When you say staging, is that the company actually placing that in front? What do you what, use the word? Help us with that. Let me use some of the, the industry lingo. Uh, staging is the companies themselves. Uh, purposefully putting the vehicles at a location. So uh, the companies, no more than we as a city, you know, can control where the, where the vehicle stops. You know, so somebody, someone could certainly drive it into a neighborhood and park it in front of their home. Uh, the rebalancing would require the company to then go get it and put it back somewhere else um, the next day. But staging itself is where the companies place the vehicles um, and then getting the vehicles back is another part of the process. So again, we're open to council direction. We were we just trying to, to last slide. draw on some feedback that we've gotten <coughs> from other people. Yeah, our, our Jay, uh, yes. council, can I make a, I think at the end of this presentation, and there are some folks in the, in the audience who want to speak on this, I think we're either going to say to staff, yes, please go draft an ordinance and we'll come back and we'll work through all of these Absolutely. issues. Yeah. We don't, we don't need to full, fully debate these issues tonight, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a, a thumbs up, thumbs down on whether we want to have a, 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 an ordinance come back, a proposed ordinance. And one of my questions, though, was related to this last slide, and maybe Mr. Freeman has the same one. There seems to be a, a drastically different approach between Tempe and Phoenix in terms of uh, the, the, the cost uh, assessed against these companies. Uh, why is that? Is that because this Phoenix ordinance was really aimed at, at bikes and it was done before the whole scooter phenomenon? Or, right? yeah. and, and I know you're proposing more of a, a, temp, a Phoenix uh, fee model, but I just don't, I don't understand the Mayor, difference. I, I think it has everything to do with ASU okay. and volume. I'm assuming they've been overrun. So, I mean, ASU, when, once ASU said they're prohibited, I'm sure that Tempe just got, I'm just assuming, but... Uh, having heard from their city manager and others, they just, they're overwhelmed. The Tempe so staff actually did a calculation, Mayor, based on what they anticipate their staff load to support the, 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 rec, the, the licensing. Uh, we don't believe, as Mr. Brady said, that we're gonna have the volume uh, of, of vehicles that Tempe is seeing. Uh, so th th this isn't magic. It was yeah. sort of a, a, a guesstimate of how much staff time would be involved to administer any, any requirements. This is another issue that we can continue to debate when the draft ordinance comes back to sure. us, I guess. Jeremy. I just have one last question. Aren't the uh, scooters, because they're motorized, do they not already fall under the ordinance that a motorized uh, anything else would for the purposes of enforcement, uh, not driving them on a sidewalk or otherwise? Like, where do, you draw the, where do you draw the line between the definition of a motorized scooter versus any other motorized vehicle? Mayor, uh, Councilmember Whitaker, I can defer to Mr. Smith. We've spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, there's, different, there's different statements in different parts of state statute. Uh, there's one we were reading today that specifically exempts motorized skateboards. And based on my reading of that, the scooters would count as a motorized skateboard. But there could very well be something somewhere else that, that does bring them into to regulation. 
So, Mayor and Council, the definitions uh, are still subject to a lot of change, and so we have to clarify as to what it's going to imply and how other uh, ordinances or statutes uh, will be applicable. So, sort of, sort of, the breadth, but also narrowing it so that it doesn't uh, overlap on another ordinance or statute. Or if it does, we have to work out well, what's the intent as far as that overlap is it consistent with, um, and so that that becomes an issue. So, we are aware of the fact that the definition is. Um, it's, it's it's a work in progress. I guess outside of rewriting something, does the ordinance already allow today for a police officer to stop somebody who appears to be underaged or doesn't have a license, uh, sorry, under the age of 16 or whatever that age is today, to stop them and say you're driving a motorized vehicle, this is illegal, or are we not going into that realm until we actually pass something I, I can't remember that part of the, the state statute as far as the motor, motorized vehicles. So I think it depends on how the, the statute applies. If if they're not motor vehicles, then that wording would not apply. That, as Mr. Smith said, that's yeah. something we need to dig into. Okay. Mayor, and, what we could do for the purpose of time, I mean, I, I, there may be other questions. We could even just bring back to, without necessarily a specific ordinance, but just start bringing back to some bullet points on... Okay. The, the items that we would recommend and continue this dialogue and discussion um, because this is all new to us, right? It doesn't even fit within our code and trying to figure that out. I think there's cities across the country you can just, I can go on all my professional newsletters and everybody's struggling with this right now. Um, but I think we're learning from others, but we could come back with just a list, not necessarily the ordinance, but kind of here's what we're proposing yeah. and then just use that as kind of a straw man, white paper, whatever you want, and let the council begin to look at that, get it out to you a week ahead of time, and then we could have another study session, maybe not on a Monday night, where we could then have further discussion on this. I, 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 that's how I see us proceeding. Mr. Freeman. So I just have two things. So what is the benefit to the city by having these in the city? And number one, or the last one is can we uh, ban them from the city? Mm, okay. okay, we can come back to that. That would be Answer two questions. bullet points. Thank you, and we do have a couple of folks I need to get to on blue cards, but Mr. Thompson. As, uh, Chris, as, uh, from your from your professional papers and white papers and stuff that you're studying, are you're saying that other cities are dealing with this? Are there best practices out there that we can learn from? I think that from the body the of US uh, experience is growing, <laughs> so I, I don't know if there's a considered a best practice yet because it's still new. Okay, um, and I, think I, I just don't want to look just focus on Phoenix and Tempe and what yeah. they're doing, but let's look at maybe some yeah. other cities that we were hoping by doing that we could try to find some consistency regionally, but obviously it's just all over the place, yeah. so maybe we can broaden our. Uh, review of this um, outside of this area. We were hoping, I was hoping, it's a lot easier because these scooters move back and forth and the riders don't know the difference between a Tempe and a Mesa border. Um, I've kind of lost hope maybe um, based on what we see here. Maybe there's some other fundamentals we can look at, but we'll look at other practices across the country and see what they've done. I Just one request. Uh, when we come back with that same uh, report, the thing that I'd like to see is the ridership rates versus light rail, right? So I'd like to see how our citizens are actually choosing to engage, how many are riding late light rail per day and how many are actually using these. Because there's obviously an inconvenience that comes with light rail that we're willing to deal with because uh, it's a form of transportation, right? So have you guys ran any of those numbers? I guess what I would ask preliminarily and then can we bring that back when you do your presentation? We have not done so yet, but as Mr. Birdie said, we're looking at, I'd call yeah. them practices. We can give you light rail numbers. I don't yeah, know if we, we can, we can ask the vendors we, we would to have give to us the, the scooter numbers. Okay. We're not requiring at this point, so we'd have to ask. I think the easiest thing, just leave them in district four. <laughs> yeah. band, this only yeah. allowed for there. <laughs> There's a spoiler alert for how Mr. Yeah. Freeman uh, feels about this. I can tell you, I spent the weekend with a group of mayors, and knowing this was on our agenda, I asked several mayors what they thought about this, and, and this is a national issue. There's, there's, uh, yeah. there's a lot to talk about when, when we have this. Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Luna. And, and you might want to tap in the National League of Cities. It is a national issue, mm -hmm. and they have a transportation committee, I think, that's dealing with that. Maybe you can ask Mr. Butler to help you out on that. We'll do that. We are taking it all in right now because, as Mr. Brady said, it, it's all over the country. Okay, maybe before we ex uh, uh, express or provide direction, let's do get to the, the folks that have come and want to, from the public that want to speak. Thank you, gentlemen, for, for that report. First, to Mr. Robert Allen. Mr. Allen, welcome. Thank you. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We have three minutes for you to share your thoughts with us. I, I appreciate your time. I'm in very much in favor of the city regulating these things. Um, 
I'd, I'd like to see the city not limit how many vendors, because I think competition's good, but to limit how many devices, and to maybe even go through that there's renewal process that vendors can, when the renewal comes up once a year or so, it, that's when a vendor comes in, not just by putting more units on it. Um, I do, I, I do um, have seen also the uh, inexperience of drivers, and it may be cool if they can program it that are near major intersections that it's less than 15. My wife personally saw a scooter come across her and stopped or slowed down, and that scooter could not stop and went into the middle of her lane um, against a, a red light, if that made sense going faster than they can control it. Um, I do encourage that we set a lot more laws or clear regulations like they're doing. I'm all for that. I'm not for scooters on the um, competing on the sidewalk with pedestrians to put them, whoops, sorry, next to the, the sidewalk where the bikes go or, or with the motor vehicles. Um, Scott still has done actually real clear laws about that. They don't even allow scooters on a, any of the main, main arteries with four lanes um, or more or the, over 25 miles an hour, they have a statue against that. Um, we may not need all the same regulations, but having more. I'd also encourage you to instruct police officers to enforce that with, if they see anyone under 18 without a helmet or appears that way, to, to question it. And, um, and I believe you should have a driver's license to do it. One other thing that I haven't heard anyone do that I strongly encourage is that as part of the licensing, you require the companies to put on a special sticker that they're licensed on here. The key part of the stickers, besides they can have Mesa rules on them, is a phone number for a private citizen call if they need that scooter removed. It's in an inconvenient place, that there is a phone number easy to contact that vendor um, that the citizens can do. Right now, um, I've talked to some people that that's been a problem. They, they've been dropped off in convenient places and probably like you, there's only an email and never got a response. Um, but those are my biggest things about it. Um, and so I am all for some more regulations before, so for us to control it instead of them controlling us. So I appreciate your attention to this matter. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, also have a card from Joshua Miller. Mr. Miller. Mayor and council members, my name is Joshua and I'm Lime's general manager for the state of Arizona. I'm thrilled to have been working with uh, council and staff to bring our products to the uh, streets of Mesa. Uh, in review of staff's uh, presentation, I applaud the team for having a proactive uh, and reasoned approach to regulating shared active transportation vehicles. Uh, and we appreciate the transparency and open uh, communication throughout the prog uh, process. While we're generally supportive of the recommendations, we do share one rec uh, have one uh, suggestion regarding the fee structure. Uh, I've crafted a letter uh, to mayor and council staff uh, that outlines our recommendation and provides some clarity on noted concerns, and I've printed out this letter and, and supplied it to the clerk. Uh, the suggested fee structure re uh, recommended in staff presentation is a two-part structure with an annual permit as well as a per day vehicle permit. Uh, and we're simply suggesting a similar structure that includes the annual fee, but a per trip structure. So it would be per trip per vehicle. Uh, and we believe that uh, with this structure, it would actually um, allow, uh, it actually, it, an increase in ridership actually translates to an increase in fees collected by the city. So the more we're able to grow, the, the higher the revenues uh, that's collected by the city. Uh, and the details about this can be um, seen in, uh, in the letter that I crafted. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you again for your support of this matter. Uh, and I open it up to any questions you might have. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, so I suspect we'll see you in the future when we take this up. I just have oh, I'm, one. I'm sorry, Jeremy, go ahead. It's fine. I just one request. If we can get the ridership numbers from your organization, I'd love to see that data. Absolutely. We can arrange that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, Council, we need to provide some direction. Uh, I'm going to suggest my personal opinion is I would like to see staff come back with a, a draft ordinance for discussion purposes, as I say, and, and I'd like to see us set aside a, a substantial amount of time because, uh, as was indicated, this is, this is a debate that's going on nationwide, and there are a long list of, of issues to discuss related to this ordinance. So 
But I, I do feel it's appropriate to initiate regulation of this and would encourage staff to come back to us with a document that we can work on and, uh, and uh, hopefully come up with something that we all have uh, feel we can support. Other comments? Okay. Great. So, Mayor, we'll try to bring that back um, by the first of the year um, because in the meantime, there are no regulations and, you know, there are no licenses or going on. So we'll try to bring this council uh, early in um, the first of the year then. Thank okay? you very much. Uh, next item on our agenda is would not acknowledge receipts of minutes. And frankly, we have a blue card to speak on this item. Uh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry, Mr. Eschler. Please... Uh, Cool your jets for just one minute. Uh, we're going to go. We need to review the agenda for our December 10th council meeting, which I neglected to go over at the beginning of this meeting. So, council, please refer to that document. Currently, there's one item off of the consent agenda, and that is the special use permit for a, uh, a detox a detoxification uh, uh, facility that was the subject of a of an agenda item at a, a meeting or two ago. What? Are there other I don't think so. Did you want one? So, Mayor, just real quickly on the, the, uh, December 10th, you had the presentation from our fire marshal and our building right. official. So everything under um, item A is related to the revisions to the code so that it allows us to adopt the 2018 uh, building code. It had to be broken up into those pieces in order for us to adopt it, but that's probably the largest portion of this Agenda. I just want to bring that to your attention, but that is what was discussed on Thursday. That's agenda item eight. eight. Yes. And each of the paragraphs eight under that. Through 8A through 8U. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Mr. Freeman. Um, on 7A, um, we're going to have, are we going to have a presentation on that? Hold on. Eventually. Oh. The nuisance code update? Yeah. Yes. And, and so when we do, you know. Is that, is that what did we talk about any of that? Okay. okay. We can bring, we can um, be prepared to give you a presentation on well that, that after that evening, that, that afternoon. Well, we I, I, I think we can do away with the presentation. I just wanted to add some comments to that is okay. that, you know, as we, as we discuss these nuisance related updates and we're planning to go additional review as related to the past, I'd like to ask code compliance if they could, within the scope of those reviews, include some thought about tightening up the rules to illegal dumping. And that illegal dumping is multifamily housing on streets and right of ways. Uh, when tenants seem to uh, leave, they leave their uh, illegally dumped things on private property and alleyways. And I'd like there to be a way for the city, whether transportation or solid waste, to be able to very quickly remove items, you know, within 48 hours, and uh, or to find the property owner and the cost to the city for removing and disposing of items, and and so I'm just when we discuss sure. that for the nuisance yeah. code, I think we that'll can, we can bring the code compliance, and I think the city attorney's office will need to help weigh in on some of those issues. Mr. Russell's here to yeah, uh, but I think there's some legal determinations about how fast we can get on private property and move. Well, and, and some of it's on, on the sidewalk. So when oh, it's okay. on the sidewalk, okay. I think sure. we okay. have the yeah, right yeah. to No, I was thinking that, it was on the that, property. That okay. garbage, yeah. But, you know, some of the things I thought about is, you know, do we, uh, how to fund this if we want line items. And uh, Mr. Smith, we can discuss this later. If uh, And, uh, you know, do we charge more on utilities? Do we uh, pull a little bit of money out of the enterprise fund to fund Anyway, clean up within parcels and right of ways within our city. It, a lot of them is a nuisance in some of our districts. So uh, I'm just bringing that up to light, and I've had some citizen complaints on that as well. <clears throat> yes, Mr. Uh, Whitaker. On your point, are we saying that the city is going to start removing if somebody dumps on somebody's property, the city will then go in and remove that? Only if they, we have property owner's permission. It's not on this item. It's but for it's, future it's, it's discussion. Just, we're just going to discuss this in the future. future discussion. I just lay some groundwork. Okay. Uh, I would like to get a presentation on the proposed changes to the nuisance code. And I know that the uh, our next meeting is just to introduce uh, or set the hearing date. And so we have really till January the 7th True. to yeah. get into the substance of it. We'll have a presentation for you on the 10th. 
Okay, thank you. I would appreciate that. Council, any other questions regarding this agenda item or anything else on the uh, agenda for the 10th of this month? Okay, thanks. We're now then back to the study session agenda. Uh, and I do have a card uh, from Mr. Hessler would like to speak on agenda item three. Mr. Hessler, please come forward. Steve Hetzler, 1436 West Jerome. Good evening, council and staff. As a fiscal conservative, surprisingly, I don't have as much problem with public official salaries as people would expect. Recognizing a lot of qualified people don't run for office because it requires financial sacrifice and overseeing a $1.7 billion budget and nickel and diming a few thousand dollars doesn't make a lot of sense. However, having responsibility is different from taking responsibility and behaving responsibly. The minutes from the November 14th commission meeting make no mention of accountability. Discusses MACE in terms of size, salaries, and ratios between council and mayor salaries, but ignores how the city compares financially to neighboring communities. We're told the city has high utility rates to compensate for a lack of pro primary property tax. Yet when the city's tax and services burden is totaled, a process that would reflect this shift, the only city that came out worse was Glendale a city of similar demographics whose citizens are now being taxed for failed economic development um, projects. The city's debt rating remains unfavorable to other Valley cities with no signs of abating and new authorizations on the top of 100 millions that already exist. The city runs deficits in relatively good times and plan to continue to do so until they hit the troubling 8% reserve benchmark. This is not responsible. We are told that traditional metrics such as balance sheet and net position are not as important as metrics that measure the ability to extract money from its citizens. This is not responsible. Long-term debt forecasts and clear. We're, we're off the agenda item. The, the agenda item is for a receipt regarding minutes for this committee. Um, I haven't heard, I don't think even one comment, there was one comment initially about the actual minutes. This isn't an opportunity to sort of discuss them. Well, I'm halfway uh, through. And well, it might be all the way through, Mr. Resser, because I need you to talk about the agenda item, which okay, is the, the agenda. What wasn't the agenda item? The minutes. The minutes, but wasn't it about the, the um, report? No. Mayor, we already had that on a separate council meeting, and you've no. already, the council already gave direction on that. Yeah, Mr. Russell, let me update you. We, we, uh, this is no longer on the, the council salary issue was taken off the agenda because there's no support here for, for moving on that item. So the only uh, agenda item that we're, we're talking about here is approving the minutes for the for the meeting. Okay. So if you're aware of a, an error in the minutes, you can please identify that and we'd like to hear about that. But you can't speak on issues okay. other than- One the, last question. Are you saying it's been taken off the agenda item? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that happened at our meeting last Thursday. Okay, I, was con I didn't know when it was gonna be on the yeah. agenda item. I understand that. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, thanks okay. for being here. Um, the next item on our agenda is item four. Here it repeats on, or here reports on meeting, oh, I'm sorry, we, let's go back to agenda item three. Now that we've had our blue card, is there a motion to approve those minutes? Thank you, Mr. Luna and Mr. Freeman. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next item is agenda item four, to hear reports on meetings and conferences attended. Mr. Thompson. Um, yesterday, uh, Council Member, or Vice Mayor Luna and Council Member Freeman and I um, we're honored to uh, participate or to uh, be invited to observe the deployment ceremony for the 98th Signal Battalion Corps. Um, they're doing a 400-day deployment overseas, and um, and it was it was truly an honor to be there and to see. Uh, I've been through many deployments before, but uh, never one with the Signal Corps and the Army. And just to see um, how they did it was was really. Um, it was really fascinating, and, and it was, uh, you know, really heartfelt, I think, uh, from everyone that was there, you know, especially with their family members there, knowing that they're going to be gone for 400 days and mess a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the holidays and, and birthdays and so forth. So a uh, tremendous opportunity for us, and we were happy to represent the city of Mesa. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I, last week, I, on Thursday, I, I told my, Mr. Uh, Heredia asked a great question about uh, the, we, I think the topic that, uh, that prompted it was a report on Skybridge and, and uh, Frankie pointed out that there were a new administration coming into Mexico and 
was there going to continue to be support for this program? I had the honor of uh, being part of a delegation from the U.S. Conference of Mayors of going to the inauguration over the weekend uh, and had the opportunity uh, while there to talk with uh, Mexican officials about that. Uh, had the opportunity to, with uh, Governor Ducey a couple of times, um, uh, ask those kind of pointed questions. Uh, and I was uh, very uh, impressed with uh, the attitudes and the enthusiasm uh, for uh, continuing that, that program uh, with Mexican officials. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a new senator representing the state of Sonora that is part of the president's party and, and very much of an in, in, insider in the incoming administration. Had a great uh, meeting with him. Uh, I'm, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for uh, <coughs> additional engagement with the Mexican government. Uh, there's a, very, a lot of enthusiasm right now with uh, the movement that, uh, not the, the party rather, but the movement that uh, is now in, in, in uh, in office there. So uh, I'll, I'm looking forward to, to maybe sharing more of the details of that, but in engaging the council with, uh, with working with uh, some of the folks that we were able to talk to over the weekend. Other reports on conferences attended. Uh, Mr. Brady, uh, help us with scheduling of future meetings. Just a reminder, we will not have a study session this Thursday. It has been canceled. And the next study session will be Monday, December 10th. And we'll um, review the uh, review agenda one more time and have the council meeting at 545. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. And we'll convene shortly upstairs.